Today we're going to hear from uh, each of our guest writers about books and writers that have inspired them. Luke Davies is a poet, novelist, journalist and feature writer. He was born in Sydney, is the author of three novels, Isabel the Navigator, which was followed by the much celebrated Candy about the lives of two lovers with a long-term junk habit. Candy's been published in the UK, the US, and it's been translated into German, Hebrew and French. And a film version starring Heath Ledger won the AFI for Best Adapted Screenplay. Luke was awarded the Philip Hodgins Memorial Medal for Poetry in, 19, in 2004. He has published five books of poetry, including Running With Light, which won the Judith Wright Poetry Prize in 2000, and Totem, which won the 2004 Age Book of the Year. His latest book is a gripping, feverish novel about the whirlwind life of a, a drug-addicted and obsessive Howard Hughes, his astonishing achievements, his internal world, and the many ways in which he represented aspects of the century in which he lived. Welcome, Luke. There's a whole lot of stuff that, uh, this is just a wonderful uh, privilege to be able to kind of have the kind of conversation you have passionately amongst friends and say, I love this, I love this, these are the reasons. Um, and time is very limited. And um, there's a whole lot of stuff that I'm not going to talk about, things that I really love, novels like Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. I love very, very, very much. Uh, the Leopard by Giuseppe de Lampedusa. Spengler's Decline of the West is just a book that gets a bad rap and is worth the very difficult effort of reading. The White Goddess. The last couple of years I've had a Linus blanket that has been um, the short stories of the Argentinian writer um, Borges, or Borges, I'm not sure how to pronounce that particular G. Um, the Incomparable Joseph Campbell and a whole lot of obvious ones who I won't bother talking about, like Rilke and Stevens and T.S. Eliot and Apollinaire. But I'm going to talk about uh, an absolute turning point in my life that happened when I was 13 years old. That was the moment that I became, became a, a writer um, and uh, was like the kind of pebble that dropped into the pond that was me from which the ripples have been spreading out uh, ever since. And it was the moment that I discovered um, Cannery Row by John Steinbeck. This is the opening paragraph of Cannery Row. Cannery Row in Monterey in California is a poem, a stink, a grating noise, a quality of light, a tone, a habit, a nostalgia, a dream. Cannery Row is the gathered and scattered tin and iron and rust and splintered wood, chipped pavement and weedy lots and junk heaps, sardine canneries of corrugated iron, honky-tonks, restaurants and whorehouses, and little crowded groceries and laboratories and flop houses. Its inhabitants are, as the man once said, whores, pimps, gamblers, and sons of bitches, by which he meant everybody. Had the man looked through another peephole, he might have said, saints and angels and martyrs and holy men, and he would have meant the same thing. There's something that I now recognize as being intrinsically corny and a bit twee about that. I was a precocious little kid. Within a few months, I had moved on to Faulkner, which kind of blew my mind. And I understood then and I understand now that Faulkner and Steinbeck were talking about completely different things. But my emotional contact with that moment of feeling like an adult and an autonomous person who discovered a new world, the same world that Christos talked about with the Bergman films, um, you know, that feeling has never gone away. It was kind of like Steinbeck was the door and then three months later Faulkner down the corridor, Faulkner was when it opened out into the palace and I, I've been roaming around in that palace ever since. So I jumped forward like many, many years to, um, I'm like, um, I'm a heroin addict and things have been very bad for very, very many years. And, um, you know, a lot of the way that I was a pathetic criminal in many ways, all of my criminal uh, endeavors were ended in disaster basically. But an area that I was comfortable with was books. And so uh, back in the days before they had those electronic things on the fronts of bookshops, um, you know, I just used to steal a lot of books and sell them the next day. And, um, and so, and I'd steal the best books possible, the, the brand new books that were in the most demand that secondhand bookshops in Carlton would love to buy off you and turn a blind eye. And um, so books very rarely lasted more than 24 hours. The books I was reading were like secondhand books that weren't really sellable. But this book, Arctic Dreams by Barry Lopez, in the middle of that horrendous misery, 
touched something inside me that was to be the thing that reconnected me with the idea of the capacity for becoming human again after I had become so dehumanized for so many years. And I started reading this book, this passage that I'm about to read to you. One summer evening I was camped in the western Brooks Range of Alaska with a friend. From the ridge where we had pitched our tent, we looked out over tens of square miles of rolling tundra along the southern edge of the calving grounds of the western Arctic caribou herd. During those days we observed not only caribou and wolves, which we'd come to study, but wolverine and red fox, ground squirrels, delicate-legged wimbrels and aggressive jaegers, all in the unfoldings of their obscure lives. One night we watched in awe as a young grizzly bear tried repeatedly to force its way past a yielding wolf standing guard alone before a den of young pups. The bear eventually gave up and went on its way. We watched snowy owls and rough-legged hawks hunt and caribou drift like smoke through the valley. On the evening I am thinking about, it was breezy there on Ilignorak Ridge and cold, but the late night sun, small as a kite in the northern sky, poured forth an energy that burned against my cheekbones. It was on that evening that I went for a walk for the first time among the tundra birds. They all build their nests on the ground, so their vulnerability is extreme. I gazed down at a single horned lark no bigger than my fist. She stared back resolute as iron. As I approached, golden plovers, plovers abandoned their nests in hysterical ploys, artfully feigning a broken leg to distract me from the woven grass cups that couched their pale, darkly speckled eggs. Their eggs glowed with a soft, pure light like the window light in a Vermeer painting. I marveled at this intense and concentrated beauty on the vast table of the plain. I walked on to find Lapland long spurs as still on their nests as stones, their dark eyes gleaming. At the nest of two snowy owls I stopped. These are more formidable animals than plovers. I stood motionless, the wild glare in their eyes receded. One owl settled back slowly over its three eggs with an aura of primitive alertness. The other watched me and immediately sought a bond with my eyes if I started to move. I took to bowing on these evening walks. I would bow slightly with my hands in my pockets toward the birds and the evidence of life in their nests because of their fecundity, unexpected in this remote region, and because of the serene Arctic light that came down over the land like breath, like breathing. And at that exact instant in reading that book, I burst into tears for the first time in so many years because because it's because as a heroin addict, it's uh, you know that kind of like tears are a luxury basically, and you become really cold and really hard. So, so something in this writing cut through, you know, something in this uh, remote region that I was living in, you know, some kind of uh, possibility of hope reconnected me with uh, my life. And what I was reading in this literature, in this very brilliant book, um, was the sense of uh, presence, of how to be present here and now in this body at this moment in these extraordinary circumstances of being um, um, of being rather than not being <laughs> the more likely alternative um, and um, so and this is a real writer's writer book you know uh, it's it's uh, it's very popular amongst writers it's a really uh, great book and I got it. I wrote in my in my movie in the movie that I wrote, Candy. In the movie that I co-wrote, Candy, uh, there's a scene where the Heath Ledger character uh, is reading is reading the book. And I convinced the director Neil Armfield to have a close-up shot of the book, <laughs> so it gets in there. And you see that beside the bedside, beside the alarm clock of the bedside table. I'm going to like just totally bypass the stuff that I wanted to say, apart from the fact that I'm going to say it about how great Roberto Colasso is. And if, the, you know, if you check him out, you will be rewarded. The Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony is a wonderful uh, book that sort of uh, reaches down into the fundamental, uh, I think, um, you know, the mythic meanings of this question of what it means to be alive. And the book Ka, K-A, by Colasso, um, the first one is retellings of the Greek myths and legends. The second one is retellings of the great Hindu and Sanskrit myths and legends. You go backwards through these books, it's kind of like getting a really vivid um, glimpse of the history of our Western consciousness. So uh, we're running out of time and I'm going to sort of move on to um, uh, poetry, stuff that is about uh, presence. 
um, this is Yates. My 50th year had come and gone. I sat a solitary man in a crowded London shop, an open book and empty cup on the marble tabletop. While on the shop and street I gazed, my body of a sudden blazed, and 20 minutes more or less it seemed so great my happiness that I was blessed and could bless. It's just a poem that um, I love, I guess, because well, the theme of this thing that I'm talking about is the journey from the gap between the life you are leading and the life you ought to be leading being immense and on the journey towards death trying to narrow that gap by becoming a better person. I was in Auckland last week at the Writers Festival and I heard Juno Diaz talk about, he, he's just a great guy, um, the Pulitzer Prize winner guy, and uh, he talked about how talent is not enough, you know, it doesn't make us write better books the next time round. You've got to strive to become a better person, you know, and to me uh, that means just always making an effort to become more pregnant. So um, uh, I, well, I was going to read a passage that had cows in it. There's a lot of cows, obviously, in Hindu mythology, <laughs> but I'm, I won't bother with that. But this is a lovely poem by the Australian poet Philip Hodgins, who died of leukemia. Completely gratuitous, and because I love it very much. It's called The Pregnant Cow. Her swollen belly was a hammock, somewhere to sleep, a nice warm bath. This morning, in the foggy paddock, I found some mushrooms and a calf. Um, I really love, you know, I have investigated, I guess, in God of Speed, the questions of people whose lives are really lost and who don't come out the other side of that thing. I guess John Berryman is one such person. And in recent years, the last five or so years, John Berryman has been my great discovery of someone who is exceedingly difficult and dense, but um, the rewards are immense. And he has become uh, bedside reading. <laughs> Oh, well, I dip in and out. Anyway, I'm moving through The Collected right now, but The Dream Songs is a great book, and this is one of... Uh, no, this is not a dream song. Anyway, this is a poem called Op Post Number 13, and I assume that the Randall who's mentioned in this poem is Randall Jarrell, I'm not sure. In the night reaches dreamed he of better graces, of liberations and beloved faces, such as now ere dawn he sings. It would not be easy, accustomed to these things, to give up the old world, but he could try, let it all rest, have a good cry. Let Randall rest, whom your self-torturing cannot restore one instance good to, rest. He's left us now. The panic died, and in the panic's dying, so did my old friend. And I am headed west also, also, somehow. In the chambers of the end, we'll meet again. I will say Randall, he'll say Pussycat, and all will be as before, when as we sought among the beloved faces, eminence, and were dissatisfied with that, and needed more. Um, and I will uh, move on. <laughs> right, okay, I'll totally finish with this. I wanted to rave on a bit about the Australian poet Vivian Smith, because I kind of, that journey was about I was 13 years old and the door opened. In the middle of that, the glimpse into the Barry Lopez thing was about finding the, the point, the turning point that made things change. And then this is kind of like about presence again by a senior Australian poet who is uh, one of my favorite poets. And uh, this is a mature poem, you know? And it's, I guess, emotionally, this is a place that I love because it's certainly not a place that I live in emotionally, but it's one that I sort of think That'd be nice to be an old guy like Vivian Smith live and, and experiencing a reality like this and writing a poem this beautiful, which I will finish on. It's called Happiness. They tell me that the novelist next door is working on a new book full of fight with all the characters named after colors, rose and pink and black and brown and white. He's the kind of guy who knows the ropes he is so at home in his own skin. Of course, it could turn out a load of shite. And I, today, have reached a small peak of cloudless unconcern 
with no demands and no calls on my time. I'm standing at the window with a coffee, the first flush of spring on view. I know that in an hour you will return, and I will have this greeting right for you. Thanks.